Hello and welcome to The Mastering Show. My name is Ian Shepherd. I'm a mastering engineer and I run the production advice website aimed at helping you get the best results recording, mixing and mastering your music. And joining me as always is my co-host John Tidy from reaperblog.net. Hi John, how are you doing? I'm good, as always. <laughs> We're always good, aren't we? Yeah. It's, maybe we sh maybe we shouldn't be. Steve sometimes wasn't good. There was at least one episode where he, he kind of there was this pause and he kind of went. Oh, I'll be honest, I'm not great. Um, so you know you can be honest. I mean that's okay. But I'm actually quite good today. <laughs> good to be here. Excellent. So this week's topic is something I get a ton of questions on. I should probably do. I should definitely do a blog post and a video about it. Hopefully it's going to be useful to everybody out there. And it is how to master effectively for music streaming platforms. So, you know, everybody knows these days, most people discover, certainly discover new music. And a lot of them actually listen to all of their music from online platforms like iTunes, Spotify, Pandora, Tidal, Deezer, YouTube, one of the huge ones. And all of those services, apart from Tidal, depending on which subscription you have. All of them use uh, lossy encoding, so MP3 or AAC or OG Vorbis or some kind of data compression system to minimize the size of the stream so that it doesn't eat up too much of your bandwidth. And all of those change the sound of the music somewhat. Uh, and exactly how much depends on which streaming service you use and how you listen to it. Um, so there are basically three aspects of the sound that I would say we need to consider when we're talking about mastering for streaming and we'll go through each of them. Uh, the first one is just the file format that you supply to whatever service it's going to be. The second one is what effect the codec that they use, um, MP3, AAC, all those kind of things, has on the sound and what you should do about it. And then the third one, which is probably the most significant, is how loud you should master for streaming services to get the best possible sound for your music. John, do you do any preparation of stuff, of your own stuff or your client's stuff for streaming, or do you just let the client worry about that? I basically just supply them with a 16-bit wave and MP3s as well, like 320 kilobits per second MP3. Mm -hmm. I guess that would be a constant bit rate. And... Yeah, and I always have at least a dB of headroom, so I'm not too worried about it. Yeah, maybe I'm just lazy with it, because I, I don't do special mastering jobs for every different possibility. Uh, I think everyone kind of expects there to be a, a difference when it's streaming, and as long as their CD version sounds good, then those versions are going to sound just a little bit less good. Yeah, and I think we'll come back to that in the in the codec section. I mean, I basically agree with you. That I think I'm actually even more lazy than you. I actually won't even encode MP3s for people. A, because I hate MP3 with a passion, and there's a blog post for anybody who wants to read that. But B, well, we'll come to that in the codec section. Sure. So in terms of file format, we can get that out of the way really quickly. I agree with you. A 16-bit WAV or AIFF is perfectly adequate, more than adequate to supply for all these services. Um, I guess the things to say are that people shouldn't supply MP3s or AACs unless one or other platform specifically requests it, because chances are whatever you send off is going to be re-encoded by the streaming platform that you're sending it to, and a double MP3 encode is so much worse than a single MP3 encode, which is a bad thing in the first place. Um, the one thing I guess people is worth thinking about is bit depth. Apple have put a lot of time and effort into their mastered for iTunes system, I guess you would call it, or standard, uh, to try and get the best possible quality from their encoded files. So they ask you to supply the highest res files you have. So if you recorded them at high sample rates, they want them at high sample rates. And if you recorded them in fact, in order to qualify for the Mastered for iTunes badge, files have to be submitted as 24-bit. And just mentioning Mastered for iTunes reminds me we should probably come back with a little coder for it on the end. So uh, remind me if I forget to, to come back to that. But 
So that's a specific case where they're asking for high res files and I can say with confidence that their encoder is going to deal with those well and you may or may not get a better resulting encode at the end of it, depending on the material, depending on um, you know all the usual factors. I'm not sure that the same applies to any other service. I don't know for a fact that any of the other services will handle 24-bit files properly or higher sample rates. So I think in all those cases, I would supply a CD quality file, like you say. Yeah. So 16-bit, 44.1, and 16-bit dithered. Um, anybody who doesn't know what that means needs to go and listen to the dither episode, which was a couple of episodes ago and is John's uh, inaugural episode and still, I think, his unfavorite. <laughs> um, but it's very popular with you guys, so that, that's good. That'll tell you everything you ever wanted to know about dither and so much more. The problem is if you if you supply a 24-bit file, you can't be sure that the encoder won't truncate it down to 16 bits without applying dither. Um, if you apply it at high sample rates, you can't be sure that the converters that they use are going to be as good as the ones that you have. And for anybody who's not sure about the quality of their sample rate in, uh, converter, there is a really useful website, uh, src.infiniteWave dot something i believe but we'll put that link on the in the show notes on the mastering show.com for anybody who wants that and you can go there and you can basically call up almost any daw and compare it to any other in terms of the quality of the sample rate conversion and if you want to know a kind of a decent benchmark go for the vice saracen um that's still one of the best available this is all kind of minutia it doesn't drastically change i think that loss of quality is kind of greatly exaggerated. It still sounds like your song in the end. Absolutely, it still sounds your song. And to be honest, the um, I'm going to call it damage done by encoding it to MP3 or whatever probably outweighs all of these factors. Um, there was some people on Facebook getting into a huge debate about whether or not you should do the files when supplying them for MP3 encoding. And I, my advice is, as always, if in doubt, dither. 16-bit, then you know that your file is going to sound good and you won't do any harm. Um, but if you don't, my guess is that the harm done by not dithering it correctly when you make your 16-bit file probably is completely outweighed by all the other nasty things that the, the lossy encoding does. Yeah. Um, which leads us on very nicely to the second topic to, to mention, which is the codec. Um, you know, all of these... Platforms use different encoding systems. They have different qualities of encoder. I mean, just for example, I think I'm right in saying that the previews on Bandcamp are MP3 and the previews on SoundCloud are MP3, but SoundCloud is notoriously one of the worst sounding streaming platforms out there. And, and there are people who tell you that you should therefore optimize your music to kind of take into account those effects. I agree with you, John. I just, that to me is wasted time and effort. I believe that get a master that sounds great for CD and everywhere else in the world, and then just let the encoders do what they will, because you're into this whole thing of second guessing, you know, uploading things, listening back, tweaking, all the rest of it. I'm not sure that you can effectively compensate. Spend that effort trying to find an audience for your music. Yeah, absolutely. Or, or write better songs or, you know, improving your mic technique or listening to more episodes of the mastering show or, or whatever. <laughs> it's, um, you know, there's, yeah, you're not going to win that. And and the th of, it's technology, right? It's constantly being updated. I mean, I know for a fact that SoundCloud want to improve the sound of their codec. So one of these days, it's all going to change on that platform. Uh, and then all of your careful optimizations will count for nothing or you'll have to start again from scratch. And the thing is, all of these codecs, the ultimate goal of the engineers is to get the encoded file to sound as much like the original as possible. If that's their goal, they've already optimized everything as best they can. You know, how are we supposed to think that we can do better? Um, kind of not knowing how their system works and, and working blind by guesswork and all the rest of it. It's, yeah, it's, it's wasted effort. It's unlikely to be successful. So don't do that. And I think that's really all there is to say about codec. Um, you know, maybe that kind of blows out of the water a big myth. If people expected me to talk for half an hour about, you know, 
I don't know, stereo width enhancement or parallel compression or EQ, this, that, and the other, you know, I genuinely don't think that's that's time well spent, um, particularly just because there are so many streaming platforms. Right. Can we could we talk about what what audibly what those effects of the different conversions could be on the music? Um, I had a TC electronic interface and I had a special monitor button on the interface, which I believe just soloed the side channel of your mix. And they recommended that for checking for lossy codec distortion and stuff like that. Yeah, you can do that. What John's saying there is that they would mono the signal, but they would polarity invert one channel. So anything that appears in the center of your image, typically drums, bass, vocals, because one channel is polarity flipped and it's been monoed, that will cancel out and you hear everything else. You hear all the stuff that's going on in the edges of the signal, effectively. Um, and that's often where you hear a lot of the the kind of artifacts of lossy encoding, which uh, in a previous episode, I've uh, quoted my friend Nick, who described them as tweeting ultrasonic birdies. Um, it's almost, so it's a bit like somebody who's playing an accompaniment to your music on, on chime bars in the distance. Uh, it can sound swirly. It can sound Sort of glassy. squishy sound sometimes. Sometimes squishy, yeah. You you kind of tend to notice it, you, like particularly if you have something with a kind of a persistent hi hat rhythm, something like that, where there's there's lots of transient in there, and then it and high frequency content, and it kind of fading out, and you kind of hit. Yeah. If you listen carefully, you can probably hear some of it in our voices here because you're listening to an MP3 right now, and you know that's why I hate MP3 so much because it does that because MP3 is a pretty primitive codec. Um, AAC is a a more sophisticated version of the, the same idea, the same technology. Og Vorbis claims to be even more so, although I'm not hugely impressed by it. I was going to ask which ones use the uh, perceptual coding. Was it what, that what it's called? Where it- they, they all use perceptual encoding. It's, the idea is that they, they analyze the sound, figure out what you can hear and throw away what you can't. Mm-hmm. Um, so like a, a quiet and, and, sound yeah. just before a loud sound or something like that. Yeah, a lot of it is frequency masking. What happens is if you have two frequencies that are close to each other, um, I believe it's the one that is slightly higher in frequency, uh, our ear stra- slash brain puts, hears that and ignores the frequency that's slightly underneath, even if the frequency underneath is slightly louder. So basically what all these systems are doing is just slicing the, the music up into, I don't know, maybe 30 or 60 different audio bands analyzing the importance of each band moment by moment as the music goes through and throwing away nine tenths of them pretty much or certainly re- reducing the accuracy with which those bands are recorded to prioritize the ones that the codec thinks our ear is paying attention to thinks that we're perceiving most and you know when i describe it like that it's i mean that's a that's a pretty <laughs> i'm sure there's a, a ton of people out there who actually know how lossy encoding works who are hating me right now but <laughs> That's kind of how it works, and it's kind of a miracle that it works at all. When you, th- you know, because the truth is, most people are hard pressed to tell the difference between a three twenty kbps MP three and the CD. More people can kind of hear it at one two eight kilobits per second, but you know, there's there's a load of people, me, me included. I listen to music on an iPod all the time, um, and I'm perfectly happy with the quality for the most part. I listen to a lot of music in my kitchen on a mono Bluetooth speaker streaming from apple music which is probably like Mm -hmm. the worst possible way of doing it but i've still had songs give me goosebumps on that terrible system so you know i remember when i was a kid i had a little transistor radio it was about the size of four of the original clunky ipods (laughs) kind of blocked together it was i guess maybe a small paperback book something like that and you know it was am radio i mean the 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 specifications of that system and and same thing. I would listen to that. Well, actually, no. Even then, I was I was annoyed by the sound quality, but I still enjoyed the music. You know, I enjoyed the music despite the format that it was being supplied to me in. And I think that's that's still true. And you know, the codecs these days are, are way way better than that. Having said that, I do have a real pet hate for the sounds of lossy encoding because the problems that you get with AM radio were limited signal to noise ratio, limited bandwidth, distortion, crackle, all of these kind of lovely analog effects that in lower levels we really enjoy about or some people enjoy about vinyl um whereas these new artifacts that are introduced by the lossy 
codex, they're much more subtle, they're much harder to hear, but they're completely unnatural. It's like truncation distortion and all of these other digital effects. They're, they're the kind of thing you just don't hear in the real world. So I think possibly long term, they're more irritating or potentially more irritating than certainly than what you get off FM radio, say. You know, FM radio is actually pretty good sounding um, if you have decent signal strength. So, yeah, it's that's that's we've used plenty of words there to say, don't worry about this stuff. <laughs> Unless you want to raise anything else, we can move on. There was one question that came to mind. Um, if you want to put music on your own site for attracting clients, let's say, um, should you use a streaming service like embedding a Spotify playlist or embedding uh, SoundCloud, or should you just host the files yourself so that you have control over the codec? Good question. I, so I have a Spotify playlist that I use as a kind of showreel of my, you know, some of my favorite projects over the years. Um, I also have a, a Pinterest page where I just drop in links to recent projects and they link back to wherever the artists have hosted their music, um, which is kind of useful for stuff that isn't on Spotify. I think the only reason for hosting it yourself would be if something isn't on Spotify or, um, you know, you have kind of copyright issues um, it's a bit of a grey area. I don't think I can really advise everybody to upload other people's music to their site without their permission, you know, because that technically you're violating their copyright by doing that. I think hosting yourself is probably just too much like hard work. Bandcamp is really good. If it's stuff that you've got permission to use, because they give you an, a nice looking embeddable player, you know, you just copy and paste the link. It gives you a little graphic of the artwork, um, links back to there to anybody who wants to buy the stuff. Um, you know, all kinds of indie artists have, have recommended Bandcamp to me and I recommend it to people and they're delighted with it. SoundCloud, I can't recommend because the sound quality is just so poor at the moment. Which is why we use it for the Bastring show. Exactly. <laughs> Actually, well, no, there's an interesting point. So, okay, there's a detail that we could mention for people. If you listen on the, using the embedded player on the masteringshow.com or on the SoundCloud site, you're not hearing this show at its best quality. We're uploading MP3s because that's what they request. And you then hear something that's been double encoded coming through that player. They reduce the bandwidth further for the web players. However, if you're listening on some kind of device, you've downloaded this via a podcast player, or you've chosen to download the file yourself and you're playing it in your favorite music player app, they've given you access to the original MP3 that we upload. Steve and I had quite a big argument about this when the, the show first uh, got going because he recommended that we host it on SoundCloud. He said the features are great. There's a, a built in audience there. You'll get a ton more listens and all the rest of it. All of those things are true. But before we got there, I had to find out for myself that people would get access to the original MP3 file because I know that the encodes that we're doing are decent quality. So you're kind of bypassing that problem with the SoundCloud quality by doing it that route. And the same thing applies to uploading your music. It's it's when people use the embedded player that the, the problem comes. Right. Um, and I have to say, actually, having recommended Bandcamp, the quality of that, I think, has decreased. I remember being really impressed with it in the early days, and I suspect they've reduced the bandwidth of that since then, um, mm -hmm. which I think is a shame. You know, all of these problems, the other thing to say is all of these problems are going to go away because bandwidth is increasing all the time. All of this stuff is going to become less and less of a problem. You know, I think that one of the reasons that Apple are asking people to upload high-res files, I mean, it may be true that they can get better in quality in codes, even though they're still giving you 256 kilobits per second AAC files. But what that means is because they're holding the original quality files, they can basically have, the, I'm sure all of those files are being upgraded to higher resolution streaming formats. And one of these days, they're just going to click a switch and we're all going to get high-res downloads to our iPods and, and wherever. That's going to be true of all of the services. And of course, Tidal already offers CD quality streaming um, for anybody who wants it. So, um, yeah. Okay, then. Don't worry about the codec. <laughs> so the third and final point that I've made a note of, but we might think of a few others, I guess, um, is how loud the music should be uploaded. And... The reason that that's a factor is, as anybody who's been listening to more than a few of the episodes of the show will know, is 
pretty much all of these streaming services are using loudness management. So the number one source of complaints from listeners is when loudness changes dramatically and you get blasted by loud songs coming in after a quiet one or you can't hear the quiet song after setting your volume control on a loud song. So to improve that user experience, most of these services, by which I mean all of them except for Deezer and SoundCloud that I can think of, measure the loudness of the music and they all turn loud songs down. Uh, Tidal is the newest uh, platform to implement this and one thing that's different about them is all the other platforms also turn quiet songs up to some extent and Tidal doesn't do that at all so if you upload a quiet master to Tidal it will stay quiet um, but the key thing really is loud stuff gets turned down and all played at a similar level so in a simple way that means you don't have to worry about loudness because the streaming service is going to deal with it for you um, in practice, it's a can of worms because they all use a different method of measuring loudness. They all have a different standard replay loudness. So once they've measured the loudness of your song, they have to decide, well, am I going to turn it up or down? And they, so they have a set level that they choose to play it back at. And they're all different. And they all have slightly different rules for how and what they adjust based on that. So, for example... Like I just said, Tidal doesn't turn quiet stuff up at all. Um, Spotify is the only one that we know of that uses a limiter. So if you have quiet stuff, it will turn it up. But if it's also dynamic um, and would otherwise cause clipping, then they will limit it to prevent that. And the limiter is not the best sounding thing in the world. So you may or may not be happy with that. There's probably too many numbers to kind of really summarize it accurately but I'll, I'll give it a go i did i have done an, an infographic um which i put on my site which shows the different normalization levels and how that affects the playback levels for each of the services we can put a link to that in the show notes but for people who are interested in numbers roughly speaking these are only rough figures because tidal is the only platform that uses the loudness units the kind of the standard way of measuring loudness which seems kind of crazy in the 21st century, but that's the way that it is. So uh, Apple normalized to roughly minus 16 LUFS. Tidal normalized to minus 18 if you're listening over AirPlay. So on the, your Bluetooth speaker, they would be normalizing to minus 18. But on desktops and in the apps, they're normalizing to minus 14. YouTube is normalizing to minus 13. And Spotify is normalizing to minus 11-ish. The question is, what does that mean? And there are two features of the dynamics of your music that have an influence on this. So the first one is the peak to short-term loudness ratio. What is the space between the loudness of your music and its maximum peak level? This is similar to the DR value that the TT measures that I talked about back in the loudness episode. Um, so anybody who wants more information on this can go there to, to find out about it. And it's measured directly by my Dynameter plugin that I've talked about before. Basically, if you push the loudness of your music very high, very close to the peak, uh, you know, think Metallica, Death Magnetic, Skrillex, Nicki Minaj, <laughs> and to a lesser extent, Taylor Swift, you know, most modern pop music. If you push the level right up, there is a smaller difference between the loudness and the peak level. The streaming services will notice that and they will turn it down. So if you push the PSR of your music too low, it will get turned down. The other thing that you can measure that will tell you something about what's going on is the PLR, which is the long-term or integrated peak to loudness ratio. So it's basically they track that short-term value and then they average it out over a whole song and come up with a number that defines the entire song. You can think of that number, the PLR, as the, the loudness space that your music takes up. So the higher the PLR, the, the bigger the difference between the overall loudness and the maximum peak level, so the more peak headroom it needs to do its thing. Now, when you think that the streaming services also have a loudness level that they choose for their music, and they have a maximum peak level of zero, as all digital audio does, you can also talk about the amount of loudness space that they provide for your music to fit into. So if you follow the, the kind of my rule of thumb of not letting your music peak above minus one dB full scale, then 
for Apple, you've got their uh, replay level is minus 16. So you've got 15 dBs of loudness space for your music to fit into. YouTube are normalizing at minus 13. So you've got 12 dBs of space to fit your music in. On Spotify, you've only got 10 dBs. Um, to fit the music in. So what that means is if you measure your music and it has PLR 14, say, um, on Apple Music, it can be played back completely comfortably, no problem. On YouTube, where you've only got 12 dBs PLR available to you, if they turned your PLR 14 track up to their maximum replay level, you would get clipping. So they don't. Um, you know, as much as we can tell, because they're not actually using LU to or LUFS to decide how loud their music's going to be playing, but it's pretty reliable. In, the, in all the tests I've done, it's pretty accurate. If you've got music of PLR 14, it will play back at minus 14 instead of at minus 13, where most things are being played back. If you had your music measures PLR 16, it's going to play, get played back at minus 16, which is 3 dBs lower than some of the loudest stuff. Right. If your music has PLR eight, then it will get turned down because the the PSR, the short term loudness, is going to be even lower than that. So it's pretty loud. So they're going to turn it down, um, and it'll be playing back at minus thirteen along with pretty much everything else. But your PLR sixteen song is going to be played lower than that. I'm aware that I've been talking for a very long time, and. I need to check in and see whether any of that was making sense and what clarifications I need to make. So help me out here. That was all very boring. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> Hopefully people are still listening. I think I get it. Again, it's, it's something that I don't really think about that much because we don't have a lot of control over it. And as long as you're doing dynamic mixes that aren't too crushed, that have some headroom, they can be turned up or down without running into clipping, and they'll sound competitive with everything else, ideally, right? The loudness management of these streaming services should accommodate for that. They, sh they should be helping us, not actually something that we need to fight. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, for the most part, this is good news. So just to sort of put some context into it. Well, one of the most dynamic things that I've looked at recently was the James Blake album, which uh, I gave the Dynamic Range Day Award to, and I did an interview with Matt Colton a way back that people can listen to where we talk about that in detail. That album measures overall PLR 14. So there is 14 dBs difference between the overall loudness level of it and the maximum peak level, which is zero. When you listen to that on YouTube, because YouTube only has 12 dB of peak to loudness headroom available, it doesn't get turned up quite as much as anything, as, as some of the loudest stuff. But that's absolutely fine because it's a kind of a mellow album. You wouldn't want it to actually sound as loud as everything else for the most part. The louder bits of it still sound, if anything, slightly louder than some of the other stuff that's on there. It works absolutely fine. I think if your music measured much higher than that, then you would need to be aware that it might not get turned up as much as you would like. And if you want your music to be played really loudly, that's something you need to pay attention to. Um, when you say so turned up, do you mean by the user or by the algorithm? By the algorithm. <laughs> okay. I, I was getting confused there for a second. Um, no, I mean, you're absolutely right. The, the user can always turn stuff up, right? Well, to a point, if it's too, too limited, you're going to want to always turn it down. But that distortion doesn't go away. Yeah, absolutely. We all have a preferred listening level depending on what we're doing. You know, you have one level for when you're working. You have another one when you're, it's in the background of a party. You have another one where you want to play it to your friends. And there's another one where you want to dance to it. And you, whatever you're listening to, you put it on and you adjust the volume level so that it feels right to you. Yeah. Um, the, the, but then most people don't want to have to keep adjusting that volume control. Um, they could do. There's nothing to stop them. But... And I mean, I guess adjusting it once per album is not that big a deal, but most people listen to playlists um, or in shuffle mode these days. And the last thing they want is to be constantly adjusting the volume level. And that's what the streaming services, that's what the loudness management is trying to achieve. It's trying to minimize the need for that, for that constant changing of the, the volume control on your player. 
first world problems. <laughs> yeah, no, fat comment. <laughs> um, but it is the, one of the number the number one source of complaints. I mean, it, well, no, no, you're absolutely right. I mean, you know, it's this is why the loudness wars tick me off so much is that just use your volume control. But anyway, it 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 does really annoy people. So the loudness is being managed. The streaming services are trying to minimize that effect by measuring the loudness and trying to even it out. And yeah, you're absolutely right. For the most part, it does a good job. And the, and the good news is basically you don't have to, there's no point in trying to super crush your music um, to, to make it sound louder on these services or on the radio or anywhere else, because it's not going to work. It's going to get turned down if it's really loud. So for those of us who want to produce music with healthier dynamics, because we know that it adds, you know, punch and life and space and air into the mixes and all the rest of it that's that's great i guess i'm just being honest and you know kind of raising the issue that if you still want it to be played loud you need to be careful not to go too far in the other direction um you know so to give you an extreme example let's say you had a soundtrack to something uh that was going to be played out on tv in that case you would have to comply with the broadcast specification which asks that the integrated loudness is at minus 23 lufs let's say it's uh, has some action sequences in it with some kind of explosions or some kind of something really loud happening in it um the peak levels of that could get right up towards zero compared to the the, the dialogue which is probably down at minus 23 so you could have a plr of 20 or even 22 db difference between the peak and the loudness level if you upload that without any changes to YouTube, it's not going to get turned up anywhere near. I mean, it's going to play out at something sort of like 10 dBs lower than everything else. Again, maybe that's not a big deal. Maybe people don't expect, uh, you know, a, a drama presentation or some kind of, you know, a podcast or whatever it is to be as loud as everything else. But maybe they do. And if you want to take that into account, then you would need to manage the dynamics of your music carefully. And that would be a case where actually there would be an argument for producing a separate master um, specifically for a streaming platform. Yeah, um, that is where I run into problems with loudness where I have to totally crank my speakers. It's uh, movie clips often and, and some interview things that are made for TV. They're, they're about 10 dB too low compared to everything else. And there's still some stuff that's way too yeah. loud. Like Casey Neistat's vlogs are way too loud. Like I've got my speakers almost all the way down and they're still, <laughs> it's still louder than everything else. On YouTube or? Yeah, on YouTube. So a lot of the stuff that's made for TV is too quiet or, or like clips from films. It's just the volume is just totally different than what you, than the, the made for YouTube stuff. Exactly. And that's because they have... Uh, the kind of peak to loudness ratio you would expect in a cinema um, where everything is controlled by um, either the DTS or the Dolby Digital specifications. And yeah, YouTube measures them and goes, uh-oh, I can't turn this up without causing horrible clipping distortion, so I won't. Yeah. And the same is true of every other platform except for Spotify. Uh, Spotify typically doesn't have kind of film or TV content on it, but if it did... Uh, it would still bring the level of that up and then it would apply its own limiting to try and adjust that. So it doesn't always do it as much as you might expect. Um, so it's not that big of a problem, but it's something to be aware of. Uh -huh. So yeah, so if if anybody listening, if that's the scenario that they're in, then I would definitely think about producing a new optimized master for streaming. And in that case, I think I would aim for something like a PLR of 14 to 16. I don't think you need to reduce it right down low because anything with dialogue can stand to be a little bit quieter anyway but that raises another interesting question you know given that we have these different loudness standards on each of the streaming services uh, lots of people ask me what well, they say to me well surely that is an argument for producing an optimized master okay you say don't worry about the codex and all the rest of it but in terms of loudness we can predict how the different services are going to treat things should we not do different masters optimized for the different platforms and there's no reason that you necessarily shouldn't do that. You know, I would kind of say if you have the time and the patience to do that, go ahead. But I have the same attitude to all mastering. I believe that it is possible to produce one master that translates to almost any listening situation, especially in music. And that applies to loudness as well. So when I 
I mean, ignoring all of these numbers and these all the rest of it, if I just master stuff the way I've been doing it for the last 20 years so that it sounds great to me, it has balanced EQ, the dynamics are controlled but satisfying, works musically, all the rest of it, pretty much when I measure that, I tend to come out with an integrated loudness of something with fairly varied content of about minus 12 LUFS. Um, so that means if it's peaking at minus one, I've got a PLR of 11. PLR of 11 fits quite happily into the space of 12 that YouTube offer us. Um, it's a little bit wider than what Spotify use, but then they will apply a little bit of extra limiting and, you know, it probably will be pretty benign at that point. I don't want to kind of compromise what I think is right musically in terms of finding that sweet spot for the sake of one streaming service. So I guess the exception would be if a client wanted a particularly dynamic master. So the new, uh, there's a, a metal album out recently by Avenged Sevenfold, um, which was uh, recorded by, I think, Joe Barese, mixed by Andy Wallace, mastered by Bob Ludwig. Um, sounds fantastic. He's very dynamic by modern standards. I think it has PLR of 14 or 15, um, you know, which considering how loud and aggressive the material is, is really pretty high. I haven't checked that out on Spotify yet, so I don't know how much limiting they're applying there. It sounds pretty good on YouTube, but possibly if a client asked me to do a master like that and then asked for, do we need to optimize this for streaming? I would be honest and say, well, maybe you should consider we do a slightly hotter master to reduce that PLR down a bit so that we know that the level's not going to get messed with YouTube and, and Spotify. You know, that still these days is the exception. And so until kind of the, we see the end result of all of this loudness management where people realize that actually dynamic is the new loud and uh, they don't have to worry about this stuff so much and we start seeing more and more genuinely dynamic masters i at this point in time i still think optimizing it you know to the kind of levels that i've talked about in on the show before and that i teach people on the home mastering masterclass course um it's still going to work really well and it's going to translate across all the different platforms and that's especially true because i don't think this situation is going to last forever i was actually part of a working group in the AES, the Audio Engineering Society, that helped come up with a set of online loudness streaming recommendations. And the recommended level is actually minus 16 LUFS as a maximum, which actually is what Apple are already using. Um, and ultimately, we hope to see that go down when the European regulations on how loud portable media players like iPods can go get updated. So my hope is that over time, all the streaming services will start using LUFS, as Tidal already are, and adopt this recommendation. And at that point, in terms of rock and pop music at least, we'll pretty much be able to do whatever we like. There'll be enough headroom that we can master loud or dynamic, and the loudness management can cope with it across all the platforms. And if anybody listening would like that as well, we started a petition. Bob Katz, Elka Grimm, Matt Mayfield, who produced the original YouTube Loudness War video, and I got together um, and set up a petition, which anybody listening to this is very welcome. I'd love for you guys to sign it so that we can show the streaming services that this is actually something that uh, users want as well. And we can put the link of that into the show notes. But if anybody is interested to investigate this, then the ideal tool to do so is my Dynameter plugin that I mentioned before, because it measures the PLR and the PSR of the music. So you can see if you're squashing it too much and it's going to get turned down, you can check the PLR and see if it's very high and therefore your music may not get turned up as much as you would like by the streaming services. Um, it even gives you presets so you can compare the measured PLR of your music with the available loudness space on Spotify and Tidal and YouTube and Apple and everywhere else. So, and this week, as we record this show, we have the infamous Black Friday promotional event where everybody sells their stuff for amazing prices. And we have a, an offer, well, Meter Plugs have an offer on all of their plugins. Meter Plugs is the company that helped develop 
my plugins and we will put a link and the promo code for anybody listening uh, in the show notes at themasteringshow.com for anybody who'd like to check that out. You know, it's not essential and you can make these measurements yourself using any loudness meter. It's just that we specifically designed Dynameter to make that as easy and intuitive as, as possible. So if anybody is listening is interested in going into that in more detail, um, I, I would you know, genuinely recommend taking a look. If you follow the link in the show notes, then there's a, we've just done a new two minute promo video um, that I think does a pretty good job of explaining how it works and how you can read the meter and how it can help you. So um, of course, I'm gonna say you guys should check that out. <laughs> um, <laughs> plug over. Are you feeling any clearer or is it all still really boring and confusing? <laughs> I think I think we're good. You had some addendum to the Master for iTunes thing you wanted to mention. I don't know if you've already covered that. People ask me, how do you master for iTunes? Um, the recommendations say don't exceed minus one peak, which is already one of my recommendations, partly because of the whole Master for iTunes issue. Oh, I remember what I was going to say. If you want to get the Master for iTunes badge on your music... Uh, it needs to be submitted by a certified facility. Um, I'm certified. Most of the major mastering houses these days are certified. So even if your music complies with the spec, if it hasn't been, uh, I guess, signed off by a certified facility, it could get rejected by Apple. They will basically, when you send the stuff in and say, I want this to have the mastered for iTunes badge, they will check the technical specs and then they will ask you, what the, where the mastering house was so that's something to be aware of it may be possible to get yourself certified by uh, contacting apple but they're still not publishing the details of that process um, publicly as far as i'm aware so and, and i'm not able to give those details out unfortunately they approached me and asked if i would like to be certified and i said yes so typical apple everything behind closed doors as far as that goes but the requirements are fairly simple it needs to be at least 24 bit it doesn't have to be high sample rate, um, but if you record it at a high sample rate, that's what they want you to supply. They recommend that you don't push the loudness too high, but I just saw something in the store, a new release with uh, 2.5 dB of intersample peaks and the loudness up at kind of, I don't know, minus six, minus five. Um, so there's plenty of people who ignore those badge. recommendations. It had the badge, absolutely. They yeah, they won't reject it on the basis that you haven't followed their recommendations. They just offer those as as a guide. So they they recommend conservative loudness levels along the lines of what I suggest. They recommend you don't peak above minus one. Um, but uh, yeah, basically only if the bit depth is low would they reject it on technical uh, on a technical basis. Um, hmm. You also have to have it go via the certified mastering house and you need to, it needs to be supplied via an aggregator who's hooked into their system. So for example, TuneCore. I know for a fact that CD Baby, yep, and TuneCore as well, um, you know, you can say to them, I would like this to get the Master for iTunes badge, please. And uh, I think you, with CD Baby, you pay a little bit more. I don't know about TuneCore because um, I think it kind of counts as a separate submission, but that process exists. But again, if you upload it yourself, I don't think that option is available to individuals. I think it's, I think record companies can do it. And, and as I say, some of the, the big kind of aggregators and distributors can do it. Um, but yeah, hopefully that, that kind of extra detail helps anybody who's interested in doing mastered for iTunes. And uh, there are a couple of blog posts on the website that we can put the links in for people if they want to look into that in more detail. One last thing, mm -hmm. wondering if you have any opinions on the plugins that let you monitor through different lossy codecs in your mix or in your mastering. I haven't used them. I actually, I'm using WaveLab 9, which has one. So I should definitely play with it. Well, I tell a lie. I've used the one that's supplied by Apple for Mastered for iTunes. Mm -hmm. That works well. Your mileage will vary depending on which DAW you're trying to get it to work in these days. I think you've had problems with it, haven't you? In, in I Reaper? never had it work. You never had it work? Yeah, it never worked huh, for me. Okay. It worked fine for me in, in WaveLab and Logic um, last time I tried it. So I've tried that one, and then there are others. Who else makes them? I mean, Isotope have one in the latest version of Ozone, I think. And Sonox makes one with Yeah, Fraunhofer. exactly. Sonox was the other one I was thinking of. 
if you're going to ignore everything I said about not worrying about the codex, <laughs> I think they're a great idea. <laughs> um, what they are useful for is previewing whether you're going to, what's going to happen to the peak level, right? Because we talked about intersample peaks in a previous episode. I'm sorry, I can't remember which one. But, you know, basically when you go through that encoding process that we talked about, slicing the sound up and throwing away nine tenths of it and, and trying to create this thing that sounds as close to the original as possible however close it sounds to the original the peak level is going to have nothing to do with what it used to be and if your music is peaking very close to zero uh, and the loudness is fairly high there's a good chance that the the reconstructed peaks when you decode this file actually will go above zero so those are called intersample peaks that's another reason for not letting your music peak above minus one because that will pretty much safeguard you against that effect you know you might get the odd one or two here and there but especially if you're not pushing the loudness too high that's going to be a good safety net for you but if you want to check then you can use these preview functions because basically you run your music through you can compare you know flip between a and b of the, the source and the encoded file and you can look at the peak levels um, afterwards and see what they're doing and adjust it to taste if you want to when I had the Apple one and was testing it, I ran a few things through that I had mastered recently, uh, satisfied myself that I wasn't getting horrible into sample clipping, listened to the encoded thing and thought, oh, it's a shame it's not quite as good as the original, but nobody really minds, um, and moved on. So it's not like I check every master. I think Apple assume that you will if you're supplying mastered for iTunes masters. And if somebody specifically asks me to supply a mastered for iTunes master, then I do, uh, you know, kind of due diligence, I guess. But I don't really ever get any surprises from that, especially if you're using an intersample aware limiter, um, which a good number of them are these days. If I was going to sum that up, I would say, yeah, if you get one for free, you know, with WaveLab or Ozone or whatever, then great, have a play with it and, and, and see whether you agree with the opinions I've put forward on this show. You know, don't necessarily take my word for it see whether you think it sounds indifferent, see whether the intersample peaking bothers you. But I'm not sure that I would go out and pay a huge amount of money for it myself. And even when I have one, you know, I think kind of agonising over it. Again, as you said, you're back into the all of these minutiae that, um, you know, what really counts is how the music sounds. Does it still make you nod your head? Does it make you smile? Does it give you goosebumps? All that stuff. Um which is, at the end of the day, what mastering is all about. Which seems like a great place to stop. And I'm aware that last week we didn't have a mastering maxim. And I'm aware that this week I don't have a mastering maxim planned. So <laughs> I'm going to turn what I just said into it and what you said right back at the beginning of the program, which is, you know, by all means be interested in this stuff. By all means pay attention to it. Uh, by all means, try Dynameter and use it to get better dynamics, to make the maximum use of the dynamics you can without being penalised by the loudness management that you get on streaming services. But at the end of the day, make the music sound great and move on. Sounds good. Okay, great. So um, thanks, John, for asking some really useful and helpful questions. I'm convinced that they will have helped stop people get bored and stop listening um, and shed more light on my huge rant about half the way through the show yeah thanks for your help my pleasure and thanks you guys for listening i hope you found it useful or interesting please let me know if you have any questions please head over to themasteringshow.com to get the promo code for dynameter if you're listening in the week that this was released or perception or any of the other meter plugs plugins and, and check out some of those blog posts if you're interested. You can also sign up for the email hotlist there to be notified as soon as new episodes are released. And if we do any kinds of other promotions or competitions or any extra little bits and bobs like that, I'll be honest, we haven't done any yet, but I do plan to. So sign up just in case, because you never know when that stuff's going to be coming. Check out John's site, reaperblog.net. Say hello to both of us on social media. Check out my site, productionadvice.co.uk. Thanks again to John for being my co-host and for editing and mixing the show. And thanks to Kaylee Law for his excellent music. And thanks to you for listening.
Cool. Okay, so say something where you agree with me and then we can sign off. Absolutely.